Oh, we're live. Well, welcome everybody to this 12 steps to plan the Google Live Hangout. And basically, in the next hour, we're going to talk about indoor aquaponics, farming, and the automation. Therefore, I'm going to show you the plan kit, guys. They are ready. Yeah, looking good. And there we have Sepp too. <laughs> Sepp Salari from Smart Crops, ready too. And yeah, um, we are all part of the, the Amy's Farm Lab Collective. And for you who does not know what Amy stands for, Amy is aquaponics, mushrooms, and insects. And basically the whole concept came into being after we were all into vertical farming, but really like thought if we only do plants, this is you know, too energy intensive. We, we need to look at nature and how ecosystem, ecosystems do it. So we need to create ecosystems which are energy efficient and resource efficient. There's basically no waste where that is where the Amy uh, concept came from, which is like nature, highly complex. And that is why we need international collaboration. And that's where Amy's farm lab came into being. How sim that's a simple explanation, right? That's, that was a good one, huh, Radu? Yeah, not bad. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks. Uh, so in the, the next hour, we'll learn all about Plan Geek and what they are doing on aquaponics and, uh, and their farming automation and data collection and all the stuff. And for this, uh, we got a, uh, another expert on the line. His name is Seppe Salari from Smart Crops in the Netherlands. Welcome, Seppe. Thank you, Chef. Hi. Yeah. Uh, Seppe is like a, he's a master student at the University of Wageningen, but he's already, he's like Steve Jobs, but then better than Steve Jobs. He hasn't dropped out yet. Uh, he, uh, he's, he's already starting his startup with Smart Crops, looking to uh, build uh, Amy Farms or food producing ecosystems. And his speciality is starting with insects, isn't it, Seppe? Black soul flies, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Voila. Um, okay. So, by the way, I am Jeff. I'm into mushrooms. You know, this, this is the company I'm working for. Uh, I'm into mushrooms in Belgium. And uh, now we're going to go to the Plan Geek team, you know. The Plan Geeks are uh, located in Romania. Uh, like I said, they are uh, specialized in, in their farming automation with aquaponics. Uh, they're actually doing a research uh, project on that in the University of uh, Agricultural Sciences and Veterinary something. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, you also have veterinarians in your school, right? Yeah, veterinary medicine, it's called. Ah, veterinary medicine, correct. All right. Um, and then the team is Radu, Radish and Vojku. Uh, Radu and Radish uh, have also have already been like in the beginning of Amy. We've wrote, written the, the Amy white paper. The first one, two years ago, we made Amy banners. And Ra, uh, Radish is actually the, the designer of the whole, uh, the whole team. He, if you see here, this is what, what Radish designed. This is his doing. <laughs> <laughs> Very beautiful. Um, Radu is also working on a Melissa, Melissa project with the European Space Agency from Waste to Taste, and, um, which is basically using space technology to apply here on Earth in the ecosystem way, because in space, obviously, uh, we, we cannot waste anything because it's too expensive uh, to get it up there. That's the basic idea. And uh, from Waste to Taste is actually a very cool project that uses uh, human pee to grow mint and to clean the water to make mint tea, which is a very cool concept of uh, no waste. I'm correct in explaining that, Radu. Yeah, I think you're a good ambassador for, for both of the projects for us. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And lastly, not leastly, uh, we have Voiku. He's the, the guy, the, the, technolo the technological guy, the, the developer who is like specialized in the and the, the developing of and Arduino part and the Raspberry Pi to actually analyze all, to get all the data from out of the aquaponic system and then make Radu and Radish uh, work with the data and with the system. Correct. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's a, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Okay. But um, so in the next uh, couple of like 10 minutes, Radu and Radish and Voiko are going to give an explanation about the whole system and about Plan Geek. Um, after that, 
is going to be open for questions. And that's why we have Seppa here. Seppa is like also specialized. He will ask the better questions. And I'm like, I can talk, but I'm not very good at product farming systems <laughs> and sensors. <laughs> yeah. So that's why we have Seppa. But also, of course, everybody who's uh, following on YouTube, just start asking your questions. And I will then try to put you through in. Uh, uh, and make Radu, Radish, and Voiku answer your questions, or maybe even Seppe, you know. Uh, it will hopefully be a very fun and very interesting conversation. I'm pretty sure it will be, because it's always fun with the Amy's. Ah. So, everybody ready? Yeah. 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 All right. Radu, Radish, and Voiku, it's up to you guys. Okay, thanks a lot, Jeff. I will hand on this high tech camera. <laughs> <laughs> So, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank you, Jeff, for inviting us for this Hangout. It's always really cool to present our work and to engage with more people. These systems are already very complex, so I think the first step is to engage and share a lot. So that's what we want to do today. Just to give a little bit of context, me and Radish both finish, finished our PhDs in uh, plant science in, in, in growing them. Radish uh, worked on vertical, on green gardens on the walls. And I work with hydroponics and medicinal plants in controlled environment. And basically we looked off how, on of how technology can improve growing and how can we understand more from the plant science process and how can we apply, apply then technology. And that's also why we call this project Plant Geek because it's a combination of two domains that are always growing. One is the plant science, the knowledge. It's more and more published literature about all the things related to plants. And on the other hand, technology is evolving on a very exponential pace. So we try to bridge those two things and try to improve the food production systems. And then we put another layer of complexity going into this kind of AMI system. So more ecosystem food production. And those this, these ecosystems are very complex in all the interactions between the organisms. So we thought the best idea is to use technology, a sensoring system and software to gather a lot of data that we can analyze later to make some trends or some correlations that can be later feedback in the automation process. And our ultimate goal, which is still far away, but we are making concrete steps towards that is to have kind of a autonomous system so the, the, the software is reading the data in real time and adjusting the system based on our objectives, which is one is the yield, but the most important is the quality of the product. And this project started one year ago in July 2017, and it's funded by uh, DBU, which is the German Federal Environmental Foundation. And it's in collaboration with the University from Neubrandenburg, the university here in Romania that Jeff told about. And um, yeah, that's kind of the, the big idea of, of the project. We, we see a lot of follow-up from, from this, whether to involve insects in feeding the fish or just going deep more into developing technology in sensors or other tools to get even more knowledge about what's happening in the ecosystem and then use that for optimizing the actual existing systems. And now we will move to Rare, so he can briefly present the lab and the system that we build. So, hi guys. Uh, switch to my mic. Yeah. Okay, so can you hear me? Nice. So thanks, Radu and Jeff, for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to make a quick tour of our laboratory. So this is it. <laughs> you can follow me here, uh, where it all begins. And here in the back, we have the fish tank separated by the uh, other plant trays so that the light, uh, the light from the fish doesn't influence the plant growth. Uh, so this is the first water tank that we have. We have uh, in total four water tanks in our system and two plant trays stacked vertically. So uh, now we're growing uh, African catfish here. Um, there's a, a pump in each uh, water tank. Also a lot of sensors that Boyko's gonna talk about uh, later. We're measuring uh, pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, 
uh, from each water tank. So then we can compare the data and see the, different, uh, the, the differences between the, all the water tanks. So the water flows from here, from the fish tank, through these pipes, and it goes to a swirl filter that we introduced in our system. The swirl filter is here. Uh, so the, the um, solids from the fish are filtered and afterwards the water goes into the bacteria tank. In the bacteria tank we have substrate, so we have a substrate that help with the bacteria, um, that, 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 that help the bacteria to develop. Uh, from here the water gets pumped to the two plant trays that we have here. Um, and also, like in the other ones, like in the other tanks, we have uh, different sensors that we developed. We could develop these ones. He's going to talk, like I said, uh, later about them. We have light sensors. We have pH sensor, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and also ventilation to, for the for the plants. Hey, uh, Arish, what, yeah. what happened to the plants, man? <laughs> uh, yeah, you caught us right between uh, experiments. So you can actually you can't actually see the plants. They will be here. If you follow our Instagram in a couple of weeks, hopefully, so that would be nice to see. Uh, keep up with us. So nice. So the water. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can see here all the technical stuff uh, with the sensors, uh, how the sensors are connected to the system, and the water flows from the two plant trays into the into our drainage, and from here the water gets pumped gets pumped back to the fish tank where it all starts again. Uh, we have also a sump uh, a sump tank. Uh, to keep to have extra water in case we need it to be able to shift water between tanks and all sorts of stuff. Um, so basically, this is all the um, the tech. Here is the technical part of our system. You can see here the Raspberry Pi connected. We use it to uh, to take images, and here is uh, it's our laptop with the interface that we that we have uh, working for us. And you can see here both plant trays, you can see all the water tanks, you can see all the values that the sensors are reading in real time, which is really helpful. You can also see which pump is active, which pump is not active. You can see the ambient temperature, humidity in the, in the lab. You can also see the light readings and uh, we can, through this interface, we can select a range for the data that we're interested in and also we can compare it with other data. For example, we can compare the dissolved oxygen from the fish tank with the dissolved oxygen from the bacteria tank, as an example. You can do did, did, you make that, did you make that yourself, the whole interface? Uh, Voiko developed it, so the answer is, the answer is yes. But <laughs> we'll speak more about the, the technical stuff in, I think, now. So this was the, the short tour of our lab. Uh, the, yeah, we use an air conditioning system to, uh, to help us uh, I have, um, yeah, I'm missing a word, but yeah, we're using an air conditioning system for our laboratory. And yeah, Boiko, you can, I'm going to stop my mic now. Go, Boiko. So the idea was to have a centralized system that collects the data from all the sensors around the system and then just view them in a graphical way. So we developed the SCADA system which is short for the uh, supervisory control and data acquisition. Basically, in this system, all the data gets collected and can be further analyzed backwards. So you can see the data from two years ago, two months ago, just from yesterday or from real time. And uh, everything is presented in a graphical way. So the guys that are watching this interface know every time, every single time, like Rares said, what is happening throughout the system. We even mounted some webcams and we, they can monitor the fish, the, how the plants are growing and also how the fish are reacting when they are getting some food or where, if they are eating or not. And for a general idea, this is the main board, which has a base all on uh, Arduino Mega. It basically collects all the data via a wireless system, a wireless network. And it collects the data from all the sensors around the system and sends the data to the SCADA system. And in order to have the sensors connected wirelessly, we developed uh, a PCB for each and every part of the system. So for instance, we have a PCB for the, sump for the drainage tank, we have a PCB for the trays and so on. And each of the sensors get connected to their own PCB 
because if you connect all of them together, they interfere with each other and the data is not reliable. So the guys wouldn't have accurate readings throughout the system. So they wouldn't okay. compare like the tray with the drainage. Voigo, can I ask a noob question? What is a PCB? Yeah. PCB is prototype circuit board. Basically, it's the little thing behind it that has uh, all the circuits uh, imprinted on it. I can show you one that is already made. So you can see you have all the connections already made, like in every electronic device. And you just mount the components on it. And you just plug them in. And basically, the Arduino that is reading the sensors, it then transmits wirelessly to the main, to the main Arduino. And that's practically it. The, the sensors came each with their own specific design. So for instance, the dissolved oxygen, we have a probe and the probe via a, a connector is connected to the, a processing unit. So basically this unit reads the, the, the probe and then sends the right value to the, to the Arduino and the Arduino just reads that value and sends it wirelessly to the main Arduino. So this is this PCB uh, is recreated for each and every tank. Uh, and also we have a custom PCB that reads all the light sensors because we need to measure the light and to see how uh, light is affecting the growth of the, of the plants. So we developed some light sensors, keeping in mind that affordability was the, the main goal of the system. We just bought some sensors that are already made. They are reading the intensity of the light. And because we have to just diffuse the light because the light is so strong and in order to get accurate readings, we created some custom made enclosures for those sensors. And those sensors are getting read by this Arduino and like I said, send them wirelessly to the, to the main system. Uh, we also have like here you can see a light that is telling uh, the, the one in the lab that, okay, this pump is running. For now it's stopped because uh, we, we would have a lot of noise in the background. And we also have some uh, wireless level sensors. So this one, as you can see, we don't have water up to this level, but on the one on the bottom, we do have uh, an LED telling us that, okay, the water is above this level. And we're using uh, this type of sensors because in the first trials, we used some uh, sensors that were practically just a floating device and would have a trigger inside it. And because inside the whole system, there are the bacteria, uh, organic matters in the system, the sensors would get filled up with matter and they got stuck. And we decided, okay, this would be the next improvement of the system so we can have the flow running continuously without affecting it because uh, the flow is connected to these sensors. So every time, let's just say the water uh, drains from this tank, it gets to the minimum point. The pump, uh, the pump here stops. And the next phase is, okay, we need to bring water from the bacteria tank through the plant trays into the drainage tank so we can fill it. And whenever this one gets topped out or the other one gets bottom down, the next phase comes into place. So based on that, we have the logic of the flow throughout the entire system to get the circularity of the water throughout the system. And uh, also in order to have uh, close to real life uh, simulation of the environment, we've mounted some fans that basically just have, provide an airflow throughout the plants so, they'll, so the plants feel like they're outside and not in a controlled environment. And uh, this, for instance, uh, the fans start when the air is too humid or the temperature is too high, or if all of those parameters are within uh, the threshold, they just start for 15 minutes at, at the beginning of every hour. So we have that like natural breeze throughout the system. And basically that's about it. We also control the lights, but the lights, we just turn them on and off based on uh, cyclicity throughout the system. So uh, we, don't, we don't control the intensity of the lights or the spectrum of the lights. They're standard, they're fixed. 
but we can control the periods of, throughout the year, turned on and turned off. So the plant grow to, a, to some calculations. Okay, we need like 10 hours of light. We turn them on for 10 hours and that's it. Basically, that's the whole principle behind the light. So yeah, that's about it for, from our parts. If you have any questions, we can go to the Q&A session now. All right, all right, all right. Thank you very much, guys. Radu, Radish, and Foiku. It was a lot of information, uh, and I already <laughs> saw a lot of questions, but I'm gonna, gonna let Seppe drop the first one here. Seppe, you ready? All right. Well, congrats on the system, by the way. It really, really looks uh, awesome. And I was wondering, is this system optimized for the fish or the plants, or are you really aiming at the middle ground, so keeping both systems happy? Yeah, so we are focused on research. We didn't really look at uh, one crop over the other. It's true that you cannot have uh, best optimal production for both. In our system currently, I think it's more optimized for the fish. I think we actually have more output than the plants would need, or we could increase the, the plant growing surface, I think quite a lot of times in order to optimize it more. But uh, we are looking to just generate data as reliable as possible with the low, 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 for, low cost affordable sensors. The idea is that we would need more nitrification for the input that comes from the fish. But the denitrification is also interesting to look at because it kind of gives information that we can understand better the process. And then we can think how that can be optimized or how the balances should be in commercial scale. So that's our idea. All right. Um, the denitrification the part. So you're saying it should have been a bit bigger or? Yeah, so first we work with carbs and it's significantly lower mass, so we had really lower input for of feed uh, per per day, and now we work with catfish that grow really fast, and we also had a good source for them, so we could got get a lot, and we just try to see how far we can push our system and how, how much we can learn from the conversions of ammonia nitrate nitrate, and it was interesting to see that we got. Uh, nitrate levels comparable with the carbs that were really less in the system because I think the bacteria struggled a lot to survive comparing with the heterotrophic denitrification bacteria. But that's actually interesting because in the future, if you can optimize this uh, from the software programming, for example, if you want to grow some fruiting crops, you could lower the nitrogen just using the denitrification process. So you can kind of optimize this if you can control it. And we look at what are the parameters and then how that can be input in the automation. Uh, so you want to sort of control the nutrient solution by changing the amount of nitrification, denitrification in the system. Yeah, it would be great to have a way to control the nutrient cycle. So just starting from the feed, which is the most important input. And actually we have the less information about the feed in our system from all the senses because it's difficult to monitor how much the fish ate at every feeding time. You have to have a, a person that stays next to the tank. But we are working on some, <laughs> some imaging suffering for that also. And uh, uh, have you been working, of, like the system now is without plants, right? So you have yeah. your bio filter. When you start growing plants, do you notice that this adds to the biofilter that's present? Um, what do you mean that it adds the plants as a filtration system? You mean, yeah, you can see, you can see a very abrupt, like in the graph of the nitrate right from the plants entering the system, because normally we grow them as seedlings out of the system in on the trays, but on different trays that are not connecting with the system. And, and then when you put the young ants in the system, you can already see a big shift. And it actually, it's kind of a very dynamic imbalance of nutrients and it takes a time to get balanced again. Then yeah. it's kind of more or less uh, the same. But again, it's these influences are influencing how fish are eating, but it's a closed loop 
system and then how fish are eating are influencing back this parameter. So it's always like a feedback loop. So if you don't have all the information, it's very difficult to see what influenced what and how you can optimize. Yeah, I, I can imagine because so you're saying if the filter is working suboptimal, you can feed your fish, fish less because they will be less hungry. Uh, yeah, and, and, and we, as, as you know, because <laughs> we, full disclosure, we discussed a lot about this <laughs> in private, uh, we, we set our feeding ratio based on the body mass of the fishes that we have. So we always measure them and always optimize the feeding. But that's based on the rule of thumb from literature. But if you have some change of parameters in the water, they will eat less or they will most, most of the time, the problem is that they would eat less and all the dissolved uh, leftover would influence back. And yeah, so it's difficult to track. Yeah, it's a feedback loop you get. And if you, again, about nitrification, like the plants when they're nearly full grown, how much of the nitrification do you think comes from the, the plant part and how much from the biofilter part? Any estimates? Hmm. I'm, unfortunately, we could not implement some uh, nitrate, nitrate sensors in each tank as we did with pH and others, so then we could have a better estimate about this. So we do this analysis in the lab, taking samples yeah. from each tank. They are not very different from one tank to the other because it's a closed system that water circulates quickly from one end to the other. So it's, it's difficult to say. I think it would be nice to develop something to assess that in the future. Yeah, because those probes are very expensive, right? For the yeah. process. Yeah, yeah so we, we try to see if other parameters that are important, like the pH, we know that pH goes really down when the nitrification happens. We see how much we can correlate with the nitrification and how far we can go in terms of understanding the nitrate content based on other parameters. But yeah. it's, it's difficult, but I think it's doable with more data. That's smart, I guess, using a proxy measurement to uh, get your data. And yeah. uh, how does the, what's the yield compared to if you would use <laughs> a nutrient solution? You, I've asked it before, but you never had the answer, yeah? Yeah, and I will give you back the same answer. We are working on the data. It seems a bit uh, less from the conventional way of growing vertical farming synthetic fertilizer, but with really small margins, not really significant. I think what we look in, and it's maybe more interesting, and still we are analyzing the data to actually say something about this clearly, it's the quality of the plant. So we look at vitamin C, beta carotene, and all these things. We yeah. try, if that, if that would be higher than the, the normal vertical farming, because that's kind of what we compare with. I think that says a lot about the strength of an ecosystem in terms of quality. And the other aspect, we never had problems, although we are not, we are not in like lab coats and all covered with gloves, but we never had problems with diseases and pests and all those things. I'm, I'm not 100% certain to say that this is what happens, but I think it, like, kind of this ecosystem is more sturdy than normal cultivation. Yeah, because it's still with good bacteria, I guess, with the yeah. bacteria you want, and there's no room for mm. bacteria. Maybe. That, that's actually a, a question from uh, someone in the audience, uh, from Raymond Hendricks. He's from uh, um, Pretty Smart Power Girls in the Netherlands. Kind of cool. Uh, and he, he was wondering if you ever did an experiment without bacteria. So I guess you had to clean the whole thing out. Uh, I think it's nearly too impossible to do without bacteria because we add bacteria to kickstart the system, but the bacteria develops naturally. So yeah, yeah. obviously. And we don't we don't have now the resources to follow the bacteria quantitative if that's a word, because <laughs> that would add to our data to see like what are the populations of bacteria and how that influences the system. Mm. One step. I've, I've seen a company actually, but it was, they were measuring the amount of bacteria on the actual salads and they were very proud that almost no bacteria were on there. And it sure depends, yeah. depends on what bacteria I talk about because we need yeah. bacteria for nitrification in the water. 
like yeah. the nitrifying bacteria, maybe also for the denitrification we need. We don't need like bacteria that it's, that it's leading to uh, food safety issues, I would say. Well, I'm a big fan of bacteria myself, you know, <laughs> ecosystems. <laughs> the bacteria in your system live on the roots, right? So not on the leaves of the plant, so that should be no problem. Yeah, and I think what Jeff means is like different pathogens that could appear on the, well, the edible have, mass of the plants. We have bacteria everywhere now, so yeah. living without them is like, it's like uh, going against nature, I would say. <laughs> that's, that's never a good idea because we are nature. Even if we do it in controlled environment, we're still nature. Or is that too much above the Jeffian line? This? <laughs> it's, it's a bit too high. I think we are aiming there but uh, we are far from <laughs> well i needed to break the, the science nature. here a bit. i needed to break the science here to it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but let's go back to the science <laughs> <laughs> um we, we have a, another question going a bit back uh, to the roots from uh, mark horner from the soya project uh he was wondering uh why you're using catfish is that by accident or you're like is there a reason for this <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, so we, should, we started the project with goldfish actually, but they were too small and the fish mass was not enough to grow the plants and the quantity of plants that we needed. So then we, fish, we switched to uh, carp uh, and we still had the same problem and the carp uh, turned out to be really, um, what's the word, really sensitive to our system because we have uh, fluctuations in the pH also, the dissolved oxygen uh, was not uh, according to their living standards. And we had a lot of problems. At one point, the fish started to jump from our system. Yeah, that was really tragic to see. <laughs> and due to the pH level, uh, sort, sort of spots appeared on them, like red, reddish scars. So we decided to switch to a more, uh, re not reliable, more durable fish. And this is why we chose the African catfish. So it's grown locally. Uh, it's used to uh, live in a closed environment. It's really sturdy to the pH differences and also to a lower dissolved oxygen level. So this is why we are now working with catfish. Yeah, I think it's important just to add on this that as doing research in this kind of environment, we have like a lot of variables and it's very difficult to make sense of it. And then if we control the pH, for example, for optimal growth or anything, and that would be another var variable in our system. So we decided to not uh, do this kind of common practices to lower or higher your pH to bring it to your optimal levels, just to see uh, what happens and what we can learn from it and see if there are kind of other ways to control the pH, for example, from the nit nitrification, denitrification, which is maybe a little a little bit more or less invasive than what is normally done today. Okay. All right, cool. So, do you under, understand as well that, the, that the, the carps and the goldfish didn't poo enough in the beginning? We, we also, to be, to be <laughs> totally honest, me and Radish have backgrounds in plants and we yeah. jumped in an ecosystem where we had to learn a lot about fish. If you think of it a bit ignorant like we did. Aquaponics is just having some fish feeding them and using that water to, go, to grow plants. But all the, the first step, the feeding the fish and growing them and all those processes was an important learning curve for us. And with this, also the idea of not being involved in the system and just learn from it. We just thought that this kind of AMI systems gives you the opportunity to adapt to your situation instead of always try to optimize your system like with other chemicals for regulating pH. Just learn that this is how your setup for now works. See how you can optimize and then change your species. For example, we start with spinach, which was not very good in our system. And now we turn to basil for research purposes. And we just change when we, we see it's appropriate. Cool. And uh, there is another question from Alex Fontel, Mr. Amy also, we know him very well. Um, and he was uh, asking, uh, what would you say are the top three parameters, variables uh, worth measuring and sharing? 
like uh, you know the most important uh, parameters to to measure, or are they all equally important? Mm. I think there are few that are more important than others. I would say they are all equally important if you really want to have a clear image. But I would say the most important and that, that we didn't really consider in the beginning and now we are putting more effort in this than others, it's the feeding input and getting data from that what, what you fed the fish and what happened with the food if they ate everything and so on. And then going on this chain just analyzing the nitrate, nitrate more often, maybe with sensors rather than in the lab, that's pretty expensive. And then comes maybe different classes of importance for the pH and other things that you can measure in the system. But in the same time, it's, I think there are two models. One is to have really good sensors for monitoring everything and then big models and whatever, or have really a lot of data from Less, ex uh, less expensive sensors like pH. If there would be like 1,000 farms like ours <laughs> sharing the data together, I think you could make a lot of sense from just cheap sensors than from the more expensive ones. Cool. I, I, I want to go back to Sepa. Sepa, like you're the insect man, and Radu just talked about the input uh, from, for, for the feed of the fishes. Like, uh, is there a, co a combination possible there? Do you think, or? <laughs> of course there is with uh, edible insects. Of course you grow them on waste streams and you use them to feed fish. I mean, for some species like a trout, the natural diet really consists of uh, flies and larvae and stuff. So that would be really nice and might even add some more uh, micronutrients to your water, which would could increase the plant growth. So yeah, that would be really nice to make, make it even more uh, of a closed system. Rather, would, would you guys do experiments with this one, with the black soldier flies, or do you have any plans to do so? Yeah, we are debating what, are, what would be the best next steps. So there are different paths we can follow. Also depends on the uh, the grants that we could get to continue doing research. We are mostly focused on research. I don't think we are much, or these systems or how we are approaching the systems are mature enough to go commercial, especially in this area, but yeah, or maybe we don't have the expertise for this, but we want to continue research. So one is the technology way to develop more of understanding this process, so more sensors, more ways, more, I don't know, for, even from analyzing data, I was speaking with, uh, with somebody that actually was recommended from SEPE that we can make some tools of analyzing data in real time so we don't have to uh, stop the experiments like we did now and work on analyzing the data, understanding it, which is quite a, a heavy duty job and then optimizing the system so then it's more on the flow. Maybe we can develop more sensors. We are working on this way of analyzing the feed of the fish remotely and transform pictures into quantitative data. That would be very useful. The other thing would be to just add more loops into our loop. I think that would be very nice and I think we'd enjoy doing that. It add more complexity. So if we do that, I think it would be very good if there would be many others doing that in the same time so we can sync our efforts. Otherwise, we would maybe understand a lot about our own system and then if you want to scale it up or we want to see how it could um, work on commercial scale, we would not have the, the data to do that. Uh, I have a question for Voiku, um, and it's also a, a little bit related to what uh, Mark Horler was asking. Like, uh, what were the greatest challenges in setting up? But I would narrow that down to, into the, the data collection part. What is the biggest challenge to actually uh, collect the data or to develop the Arduinos and the Raspberry Pi and the whole data collection system? Uh, I think the biggest challenge was to get the system to work reliably enough to offer reliable data and constant data flows to the, to the guys and having uh, not so expensive uh, components in our system. For instance, Arduino is more on a hobby side 
and to use it in a scientific way and more of like industrial way to read the sensors 24 7 seven days a week that was one of the biggest challenges and to find sensors that are not that expensive but uh, also they can be in the system all the time and gather data for the guys that i think that was the biggest challenge and in order to do that we we had to just trial and error it. For instance, when we first started, everything was connected to the main board and we had a lot of interference and the data would just jump back and forward and the data was not reliable. And step by step, getting to the wireless sensors and having a wireless network, for instance, and each, each one of them is powered separately so they don't interfere with each other because interferences in this type of systems are a mad pain, the headache, you know, like the EC and pH, if you place them in the same body of water, the way the EC gets measured would interfere with the pH measurement. So every time you would, if you would, uh, for instance, measure them both at the same time, uh, the pH would be 14, and the EC would, would, would get a reliable reading, but then you would have to shut down the AC and power on the pH to read the pH accordingly, and you need to stabilize the data. So that, that was one of the challenges, and just separate the data streams in order for the data to be reliable and the guys to be satisfied with, okay, this is the flow, we, we get the data from the flow and we can analyze it and not just have like uh, huge chunks of data that we cannot rely on. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you, you kind of, how do you say, solved that challenge. Uh, are, are there more like challenges on that area to solve or are you like, uh, you have like built the system and it's stable and sturdy now or it's like improvements are still needed? Well, improvements, you can get improvements all, all the time. You, know, you get an idea, okay, we should like place another sensor somewhere and how do you scale the sensors just to integrate another sensor into your, into your system and how to get that reliable data in. And uh, from this point of view, you will always get challenges because uh, you know the least expensive sensors, uh, they're not meant to be used in industrial ways and you have some uh, like limits to this, to this type of sensor and you need to compromise somewhere. So okay, you, you don't get very accurate like 0 0.007 uh, micrograms of something you have to compromise somewhere to say, okay, this is the most reliable data I can get from this type of system, or you go with the prices higher and you get more uh, expensive sensors and that are more reliable and you can get uh, more accurate reading. But I think you need to establish like an equilibrium between them so you can use uh, less expensive sensors but you can expect at the same time that you will have some uh, points in time when you when you want to get stuck or the system will just hang for what, no whatever reason, you know, because they are least expensive uh, sensors, for instance. Yeah, and if I can add, would be another way to improve this is working on the software area because, I, because I'm a bit ignorant in this field. I come with ideas and then I pitch them to work like and we did this for example just the, the flow is now going based on the sensors the level sensors how it be to kind of be more involved and control that to have for example more time for the bacteria if we get knowledge that they need this for the identification and so on so i think on that area it's also a space for improvement not just developing the sensors for getting data and like step by step little by little try to make the system a bit more self-reliant as possible if it's possible. About self-reliancy, um, 
do you really need to do much in the system now? I mean, you feed the fish. I guess that's also an automated feeder. But are there any other jobs like cleaning out filters or is really everything going by itself? Uh, mostly everything is going uh, by itself and mostly the labor that we do in the lab it's getting data that we cannot do from the sensors, getting samples for nitrate, nitrate, getting samples from vitamin C analysis and so on. We have to do some regular cleaning. For example, with the sensors, we try to improve now the, the, the transfer of solids in the system because it, it get, they get attached to the sensor very quickly and that can ruin the re re reliability, especially with the dissolved uh, oxygen sensor, which they are, we are still struggling with that because it's really fine membrane. If you get a bit of biofilm, it's, you cannot count on those, those readings anymore. But we try to see on the hardware what we can improve for, for that area. And yeah, it's good to have a, a good protocol for cleaning and also very strict because it's research. So if you clean too often in one week rather than the other week, then your data it's, again has another variable. So yeah. In regard to maintenance, we also have to clean the water pumps. Because yeah. the solids, they get clogged really often. And yeah. it happened, I think, one time that the system wasn't working and it was due to the a pump being clogged. Yeah. So that's also something that we have to do on a regular basis. Yeah. So now we just had some dirty water pumps. So we hope we have less cleaning to do because we yeah, maybe we have to get rid of some fish. We already have like maybe 20 kilos of fish. <laughs> <laughs> but we, just, we are just like, okay, let's go a bit more and... We have that fear of not having enough of our experience with carbs and so on. But definitely we can optimize still a lot in that area. Have you thought about adding other organisms? So like clams or shrimps or... Yeah, I've read a lot about the, the, the solids that we get in the sewer filters and like shrimps would do better there. I guess, and there's like this bioflock technology that we learned about uh, about it from a local farmer that we want to involve this, that you kind of encourage getting solids and then getting nutrients from there and you overfeed the fish and things like this. Uh, yeah, we, you can, I mean, the the nice thing and what, what I'm attracted in, in the system for is the endless possibilities and <laughs> the little knowledge that it exists, so you can always kind of design questions and experiments to answer them. Oh, hells yeah, we're going to space, huh? One day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always saying Elon Musk doesn't know it yet, but uh, he, will need, he will need an Amy system if he wants to go to Mars. Uh, yeah. I will, I, we do have an interesting question, uh, one, that could have been asked by Sepet too, but Alessandra <laughs> beat them to the, beat them to the to the chase. Um, Alessandra should have been here, by the way, uh, but we're missing her because her internet connection failed, unfortunately. Uh, but next time she'll host the, the hangout again. Uh, but uh, anyway, she asked, uh, "What are the biggest challenges for this system?" to go commercial. And I said, Seppa could have asked this question because he's actually <laughs> trying to make this system commercial. Eh? What do you yeah. guys think? Well, uh, just first of all, we didn't consider it in the beginning. We considered a bit indirect way of going commercial, like generating knowledge so other farmers can learn from it and have better systems that they could otherwise this kind of data. This system as it is would not be profitable in, on commercial scale. We don't have enough uh, production for plants, that's for sure. We consume a lot of energy with the lights. But this have the reasons to have as controlled as possible, so we have more reliable data and understand better the process within the system than the factors that are influencing externally. And I don't know, we make some calculations to see of the energy consumption and what would be the prices of the crops. The crops would not be that expensive on the market. I think it would be competition that we would not win. <laughs> and we discussed that actually last night <laughs> with Sepe <laughs> about the economics of AMI system. So I think 
it's like if you put more technology, as Voiko said, you get more efficiency, maybe, but then it gets more expensive and you get less economical sustainability. Then if you go on the other side, the more economical sustainable is if you really lower costs in the system operational or construction and whatever. So I think what would a layer that it's missing at the moment, because I think it's also because it doesn't have enough knowledge, is the policy that could change. Because the true, true cost analysis, or how, how did Sebe put it, that the impact on the environment, that it's lower in, in theory, it's not cost in today's products. If that would be added as a factor in evaluating the end product's cost, maybe this kind of system would become more sustainable and more farmers would be encouraged to go in this way. Or to put it otherwise, if you waste the waste that you produce, for example, in aquaculture, it's very expensive compared to implementing another system that will use that waste. So if you're not have some incentives to do that, it would be more difficult to implement. Yes, and one of the ideas of the project was to have multiple uh, sensors of the same type just to see how the fluctuations go around the system and to and from there to see if okay do you really need four pH sensors yeah. or you can go with just with one and that's why this system can doesn't have the potential to go commercial at this point. as it is yeah yeah as, at, at this point and and how it was thought out from the beginning because the whole idea of the project was to gather huge amounts of data and to build upon the data and to see okay which type of sensor can be eliminated later on and correlate the data for instance i don't know the pH, the ph drops and the dissolved oxygen rises so you can make a correlation if you have a pattern like and then just ignore the dissolved oxygen sensor and just use the mm. ph sensor so yeah. that was the the beginning of the, this idea was not to target the commercial part of the of the system. True. I, Seppo, I to ask you that question also is like what are the most important things you are learning from the plan gigs to actually implement the system like this commercially? I think they just did a really nice baseline of an aquaponic system, how stuff is working, and they kept it very simple in a sense. I'm excluding the sensor here, but in the biological <laughs> sense, they just took plants and fish and started with that. Because, you know, an Amy system needs, I guess, insects, mushroom to be really a circular system. And yeah, but including three organisms will give you unanalyzable data because it's just an overload. I think starting with just plants and fish is really nice because. Yeah, I've been talking with Radu quite a lot about the dynamics in their system, and I think they're uh, really gathering some important information, how all these param parameters respond to each other. I said that the plants act as part of the biofilter at some point, but how much all these kinds of things we need to know before we can really make economical uh, farms, I think. Plus, they're showing that it's working without any added substrate or uh, fertilizer. You hear a lot that in aquaponics you have to add iron, but you're mm. not adding anything, right? No, it's still, it's still the same reason for not involved with the pH regulating. It's not adding other fertilizers right, than the fish waste. And we saw some... Um, nutrient deficiencies also because of the lowering of the pH. So it was, as you know, sometimes below five, which was alarming, but plants were grew. You could see some nutrient deficiencies, but that's also information. So we have that like uh, uh, luck that we don't have to <laughs> sell our products to make our living. We, we have this grant to do research. So. We're, you guys, you you know, we're already running to an hour. Things are going fast, okay. and you're doing aim, yeah. Uh, but I have uh, one last question. Um, have you guys thought about uh, decoupled 
systems. Like you have the RAS, the, the recirculating aquaculture and the plants. And then not constantly having a flow, but like when the plants need nutrients, you get it from the RAS. Have you thought about building such a thing or what are yeah. your thoughts about it? Yeah, I will let Radesh talk about it. We discussed this about, yeah. Yeah, we sort of discussed it, but it doesn't really suit our uh, project or the goals of our project. So we talked about coupling the bacteria with the plants, uh, then uh, recirculating that part or the plants with the drainage and then the bacteria with the fish. And when the, the levels in the systems are too low or too high, just to compensate with uh, water from the other tanks. But so I think it's for a future project maybe. Yeah, and I think it could be done when we have even more certainty yeah. about these processes and conversions. Right now we could, we will do a lot of trial with add again, more factors influencing our data. But in the future, when you consider doing commercial scale, it might be worth to deal in this and kind of, if you know exactly how much of waste with combined with water goes there and how much bacteria can do for plants and so on, you could optimize that. But you need, I think, a lot of data if you just don't want to do it by guessing. All right, yeah. It's all about data, and uh, I think that's one of the most it important. Is. Yeah. yeah, and I'm happy you guys have so much knowledge about gathering data because uh, I think most starting farmers and most farms and, and even researchers need, I think need everybody needs a Voiku, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, um, we're closing to an hour. I really want to thank you all for being here, Seppe for helping me asking the questions and you did the really good part on the science there. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's cool to hear you guys talk and uh, like get into the, the very detailed stuff, uh, which you only get with high level uh, scientific knowledgeable people. Sometimes I feel a bit stupid, but that's okay. <laughs> you don't it's have okay. to be. <laughs> I think it only depends on the field. <laughs> that is true. Everybody and I think it's like, an, it's like a team is like an ecosystem if you want to keep it in this field. So you need different parts to actually make it work. Yeah, it's like Amy systems are an ecosystem, society is an ecosystem, science is oh, an ecosystem. Oh, yeah. I, I put you going there. I didn't want that. <laughs> We're going to finish like for two hours now. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. All right. Um, I want to thank you all and thank you all also the people watching via YouTube and asking all these crazy questions uh, and good questions. Um, you know, as this is uh, just a beginning field, like ecosystem indoor farming is like, there's still a lot of work to do. So probably we'll yeah. be here still in 20 years and maybe on, in 30 years, we'll be on Mars or on the moon. Who knows? <laughs> uh, actually seeing if the system can sustain life. Uh, but for now, we're going to do it every month, uh, 12 Steps Hangout. Uh, last month was Fungi Espresso, now with the Plant Geek guys. Next month, uh, we're still looking for somebody. Uh, if you know, like, a company or organization, you say, is, like, into the ecosystem farming or in the Amy farming, is already doing it, uh, let us know. We'll contact them and we'll schedule a Google Hangout. Uh, also, follow everybody on Instagram and Facebook. Follow the Plan Geeks on Instagram and Facebook. They have amazing Instagram feed. Uh, follow the Smart Croppers in the Netherlands. Eh, Seppe, follow you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can follow uh, 12 Steps to Farming, which is uh, the, the experience sharing part of Amy's Farm Lab. Uh, you can follow us too, and we'll let you know about the next Hangout. And then, you know, that's the end of this 12 Steps Hangout. Is there anything you guys want to say? You know, thank the Lord of thank uh, the the bacteria for being here for us. The African cat. Yeah. We can always <laughs> thank the bacteria and always encourage people to get in these systems and be as open and transparent and share the data if they want to make a change. Yeah. Radu, that one was above the Sheffield line. You know that, right? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all, and uh, see you next time. Huh? Yeah.
Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.